Steel is a bestseller everywhere in America. I hope you saw her in The View this week. I hope you are reading Kellyanne Conway's Here, The Deal. She's friends with Frank Luntz, as I am, so she knows the Luntz rule that you've got to say the title of a book seven times to make the book memorable. So I've said, here's the deal three times, Kellyanne. Now I'm going to turn it over to you. I like Kellyanne 1.0 stuff a lot more than Kellyanne 2.0 stuff because I didn't know much of Kellyanne 1.0 stuff, but it's all there, and here's the deal. Congratulations. Oh, thank you so much, Hugh. It's been a labor of love to write this memoir. Even though I'm 55, hopefully I have decades of life ahead of me, uh, people are always asking me about the story behind the story. And I think in many ways I've had unique opportunities, crazy, wild dramas and traumas. But it's really just everybody's American dream story, raised by a single mom, very modestly, four Italian women in the, in the household, never a political conversation I can recall, but raised to be a conservative because they were all hardworking small business owners, believed in faith and family and uh, freedom. We had military and veterans in our family, union members in our family, obviously. So it's been a great journey. Uh, and you've been, a, you've been a part of that. We started on this radio show in 2000, my goodness. And you would have me on for a weekly segment on polling, which I think is still grossly misunderstood. You know, oh, well, that was I, – I only have two beefs with the whole book, Kellyanne. The first is that uh, talk radio only got one line on page 47. But more importantly, you became a Yankees fan because you fell in love with George. And that's okay. People make mistakes. But you didn't mention the two 1997 Indians beating the Yankees in the division series, and you didn't mention the 2007 tribe beat up of the Yankees. So you conveniently, my alternative facts are this should have been about the Indians beating the Yankees. That's really funny. I didn't know George then, so how oh. is that? I'm excused. But you know who was my client then? Major League Baseball. And the, the it's funny you say that. The Indians, the Cleveland Indians, were one of the six – ballparks that we had to visit one of the six teams that we did a deep dive in our research in. Why is this important? Because my main observation, I reported back to Commissioner Steelig at the time as well, those those fans, especially the women's at the Jake, the old Jake, I know it's called Progressive Field progress. now, I think, but the old Jake, I said, they, I, I, I observed them in the food lines, the, the restroom lines, they just, they go in and they come right back out. They're dying to get right back to that game. Very serious fans, and I think that the Indians at the time, now the Guardians, delivered for them. You know what's interesting about this, but I know a lot about Kellyanne the polar, pollster because we did do this regular segment for a number of years because she didn't do – she did cultural polling, not political polling, which is the polling company that she tells the story of and here's the deal. But what I didn't know is that you are an honest-to-God sports fan. You know your stuff. I do. I grew up with my, – my cousin Jay is 10 months older than me, and he didn't have a brother. I was his tomboy and had the scars on my knees to prove it, climbing the trees, being pushed off the huffy bike, sliding into third base on the gravel. But um, seriously speaking, he taught me from a very young age all the fundamentals of the sports as a viewer and as a fan. And I do talk an awful lot about uh, the most bipartisan thing at the time in our household was George was a Yankees fan, I was an Eagles fan, but we adopted each other's teams, went to the championship games, et cetera. It definitely helped um, meeting men in my younger years that I had a more than above average knowledge of football and can actually watch a game and anticipate the plays, et cetera. But uh, I, I'm very grateful for just having many male influences in my life, my uncles, the extended family, friends, family friends, certainly my cousins. My father left when I was three, no child support, no alimony. I met him when I was 12, Hugh. We had a very present, loving relationship for 40 years until he passed away a few years ago. God rest his soul. And it's, I think that, too, is a great story for America, just mercy, redemption, forgiveness. We all seek it. We all should grant it when asked. And I think America is all about resilience and second chances. It, it is a great story for young women. Uh, and I didn't know. I think we probably attended the 5 o'clock Mass at St. Matthew's Cathedral a few times together yes. before we knew each other. But I didn't know that you let your dad back into your life at your first communion at age 12. I, I have a very inside baseball Catholic question for you. Why St. Joseph's for school but St. Anthony Padua for confirmation? <laughs> Well, there were three churches in town at the time. There aren't now, unfortunately. There are two, but there, St. Joe was the one that had the school. And it was ah. very important to my mother in the early to mid-70s to keep her only child in Catholic school. I know it was a financial sacrifice for her, Hugh, but she, she felt the Catholic Church might look at me as askew because my father was not Catholic, and then they got divorced. It was almost unheard of in those days. That was the beginning of the women's liberation movement, Roe versus Wade, Ms. Magazine, uh, women in the workplace, and, of course, no-fault divorce. So we were right in the maelstrom of that. But I really credit my mom for, for making that financial sacrifice to put and keep me in Catholic school. All 13 years, you, um, kindergarten was in the convent, the convent basement, and then all the way through 12th grade to valedictorian. 
and, and beyond. And I, I credit it really for, for, for always teaching me one fundamental thing, that there's always something in, bigger than you. It's called God. And that he also has a plan for you. And I like to say now to a lot of young people, Hugh, especially in these college campuses, don't forget what God has made, no man or woman can cancel. Don't ever forget that, because I think people are worried about being called names. They're, they're worried about the woke agenda. Remember, people call you a name, Hugh, when they don't want to know your name, when they don't want to ha- when they don't want you to have a name because it makes you real. But each and every one of us, each and every one of us are only born with two things, our name and our family, and it's up to us to protect um, both. You know, for better or for worse, it's a great book on marriage. Now, I never, ever in all these years talked about you and George because I I think people's private lives and their family lives, especially when children are there, are just not on the table for discussion. And so uh, you bury your soul in this book, and people who want to read about that can, but I want to go to something I didn't know. Uh, And as I read a book, I make my notes, I make my questions, and I wrote when I got to page, uh, uh, the first time you mentioned Mike Pence, you were his pollster and political analyst, for five years. Uh, and I wrote down from my notes what to ask Kellyanne, did he do the right thing on January 6th? But then I, thought, then I get to page 467, and you tell us uh, for a week, the media, quote, was working overtime to suggest Vice President Pence would ruin his reputation and destroy his own political future by acceding to his boss and refusing to certify the results. So you answered my question before I got to ask the question. That's why you got to read the whole book before you interview someone. Uh, Mike Pence is one of the best men I've ever met. And uh, and I don't know what his political future is. Are you back working for him, Kellyanne Conway? Well, i have one of the few people in the country who talks to uh, Donald Trump and Mike Pence fairly regularly. And I'm very grateful that that team won in 2016, stopped Hillary and her corrupt machine from taking over and being in power, and also just delivered amazing accomplishments. And I think that team is, is – it's very important to recognize all that they did together as a team. Um, I write about that because it's, it, it's a good example, Hugh, and there are many throughout the book, of the media just presuming they know what's going to happen. They always presume they know who someone is, what's in their heart, what's in their mind, what motivates them. And that's just not true. And it was not true in that example. It certainly wasn't true about Russia collusion. It wasn't true about Hillary beating Trump handily. And so again and again, they fail upward without accountability. And look, I think that the break between the former president and former vice president is regrettable, but people should... They should remember everything they were able to do together. And look, a lot of what's in the book is in the news right now. I have a whole chapter about the arc of public opinion on pro-life. Yes. I have the I have an entire chapter on, it's called uh, Life of the Party. I have a chapter in Here's the Deal, my new book out. Hugh, thanks for reading it, by the way. Thanks for having me on, but thanks for actually reading it. And I have a whole chapter now called Death Close to Home about the opioid crisis. You know, you, you grew up, I know, in Warren, Ohio. It's a very beloved place to you. Where I grew up, same story. Same story all throughout this country here where people are really suffering, they're dying, they're being harmed by the drug crisis. Under President Trump and through his, through his auspices and, and Vice President Pence, frankly, and the First Lady, the drug overdose deaths declined for the first time in 30 years. We're now back up to 107,000. You can fill up Progressive Stadium a few times and have people still looking for seats. Um, I also talk in the book about <clears throat> um, uh, Russia collusion delusion back in the, back in the news. But I think um, when you see President Trump, you see Vice President Pence, you see a lot of the leaders who uh, are in the Republican Party out there, it's a great contrast to what you see in the Democratic Party, which is they can't run on policy. There's no course correction about how poorly this this White House, this man-made disaster of an administration is doing on inflation, on immigration, on everyday affordability, and on our feeling of security. Rising crime, rising prices, uh, Putin in Ukraine. Iran salivating as a nuclear-capable threat to Israel. The the list goes on and on. Now, the warning that is in this book for every candidate, and here's the deal, and everyone is going to run and hire a pollster. I want you to go and read, here's the deal, for one anecdote. It's on page 83. Kellyanne conducts a focus group for Ken Cuccinelli in the McAuliffe campaign. But the guys on the Republican gravy train, that is a quote from Kellyanne, and here's the deal, they left the room. And they they joked about Cooch getting blown out by double digits. He lost by three. They did not pay attention to you. This is a story I have seen replayed again and again and again, where the good old boys on the gravy, gravy train don't let people in. They lock the doors, and as a result, they don't get information. Kellyanne Conway. Well, it's a, regrettable. Forget about not listening to me, Hugh. They weren't listening to the women in the focus group right. who were there to talk about their aspirations, frustrations, and give recommendations to the would-be next 
governor of the Commonwealth of Virginia. Cuccinelli lost narrowly to Terry McAuliffe. Does that name sound familiar, everybody? You know he's beatable. Glenn Youngkin beat him by about the same margin this past election cycle. But I talk about the Republican consultancy because I see it as a walking RICO violation, always greasing each other. These con- candidates often lose, Hugh, and the consultants always win. They, they, and then they blame the candidates. Oh, Bob Dole, he seemed too old. Oh, John McCain, he seemed uh, so out of touch. Oh, Mitt Romney, he was too stiff. It's like, guys, the other thing they all had in common was you. Please don't come back a fourth time. And to Donald Trump's enormous credit, he did not go back to the well of, I think, those shop-worn, unimaginative consultants who are afraid to get to know America. And there we were. That was the third of three focus groups within about 30 hours I had conducted in three different places in Virginia. Hugh, and when I went back to debrief, they were gone. They were already out to dinner. Um, and I was you, stunned. You know, so when you, it, it, and it ha- you're right, stunning. it did happen again and again and again. And I want people to know it's not, it's not a pity party for me. I can look back and laugh about it. But Cuccinelli lost. Uh, you know, that same day, he, he and Chris Christie were on the ballot. So Chris, uh, Christie got reelected in New Jersey, obviously, as the governor, two-term governor of New Jersey. And Cuccinelli lost, but he lost narrowly. And I got to tell you, there were some leaders of the Republican Party who were up in New Jersey with Christie because they figured Cuccinelli was, was toast already. Yeah. And so this is just a – listen, it's a cautionary tale. Don't tell voters what to think. Listen to voters when they tell you what they think. And I want to, before the break, we got a second uh, segment with Kellyanne on Here's the Deal. And I'm just teasing it, uh, folks. I'm just hitting some of the hot spots for me. Uh, I wish the president had taken your advice on COVID and asking the former presidents to come to the Oval to help him. And has he ever talked to you about not taking that advice? Because you gave it to him. It's what presidents should do when there's a crisis. But the former president loves to tackle problems, uh, like a developer. And there's nobody better than him at solving a problem. That's what he thinks. But, I mean, that's the way to do it. Yes. No, he did. And I remember sharing it with incoming chief of staff, Mark Meadows. Ironically, he was uh, quarantining because he had been exposed to somebody at CPAC who ended up with COVID. And um, he, you know, what he did was he, he said no. And I think part of it was the doctors at that time were, were giving very conflicting advice. So he was hearing this could be the big one, but then they were saying, well, you don't have to wear masks. Well, there's no asymptomatic transmission. There's no human-to-human transmission, the WHO was saying. So I think in those early days, it's very difficult to even wrap your head around, why would we do this? Um, and, and so in that regard, look, between that and just recommending domestic peace talks at, at, at uh, Camp David, I do think that other people should have, you know, sh- should he's the president, but other people should have maybe said, you know, that's a good idea or a bad idea. Let's at least try to make it work. Um, but he is somebody who solves problems. And, you know, you did have all those past presidents and the past first ladies do an ad in December, January or so of 2021. It came out and it was basically telling everybody to get the vaccine, which, of course, President Trump and the pharmaceutical companies developed Operation Warp Seed in record time. And they excluded uh, Trump. They excluded the Trumps from that. And I don't think it's gone as well as just Donald Trump going out there and saying, I helped develop the vaccine and I've taken it. When I come back, Kellyanne Conway will continue to talk about Here's the Deal. I put the link to the Amazon page up. You will love this book. Uh, If you like politics, if you like American stories, if you are a young woman making your way through difficult waters, if you're a young man who wants to aim high, Kellyanne Conway's Here's the Deal. Listen to more after the break. So I'm talking to the best blueberry picker in New Jersey and Hamilton, Kellyanne Conway. Here's the deal, her memoir. And I, I got to say, Kellyanne, and I'm surprised infrequently when I read memoirs. I am surprised that at the age of 13, you were picking blueberries and packing them. Uh, and I want people to read that because I, I went to work at 14 caddying, but it wasn't blueberry picking. I, I like Cider House Rules, a John Irving novel about Maine. And I, I think that's a fascinating bit. But also your, your mom and, and the Golden Girls, George Washington Law School, you didn't get into college where you wanted to go. So you went to Trinity because it's where you wanted to go. George Washington, clerkship at the U.S. Attorney's Office, big law summer associate, four bars. I've got two, and I, I know four bars. I know what that means, uh, New Jersey, PA, Maryland, and D.C. And then Richard Worthland and Frank L- I mean, this is no easy path. And I wonder, does did anyone ever ask you about it other than the president who appeared when you first sat down with him to listen to you very closely? Oh, surely. I had wonderful clients over the years and a lot of interest in my career. Look, CNN put me on TV at a very young age as the, can you imagine, the Chiron, you said Gen X 
conservative <laughs> political analyst, and there was a very smart woman named Farai Judea. She was my counterpart, and she, her Chiron said, Gen X, liberal political analyst. And they put us on TV in our 20s. And no, 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 I think what happened with the New Boys Network, too, there was a certain jealousy because I was able to do something they weren't. It was good on TV. And these were the days when nobody really got paid to go on TV, and I did. Uh, you, you just had a less diffuse you know, cable news footprint. And uh, so they had me on at the conventions. They had me on at the Iowa caucuses, New Hampshire primaries. I remember turning to Bob Novak, God rest his soul. I said, well, um, I'm going to learn from you. And I, I remember asking him because we had gone to the San Diego convention first in 1996, and then we went to Chicago for the Democrats for Clinton's reelection. I said, uh, Mr. Novak, is it me or is everybody at CNN happier this week? He said, oh, they'd pass a lie detector test. They have no idea you know, how liberal they are. They're with their friends this week at the Democratic convention. It's very funny, but – no, 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 there's huge interest for me to give speeches, to go on college campuses, to be hired. And I remember George, when we were dating and then engaged, he said, Kellyanne, why would you get on a 6 a.m. flight out of Dulles Airport to go to Seattle to give a lunch speech for $1,000? I said, because somebody invited me to give a lunch speech for $1,000. Yeah. And, and then I would fly back two stops and take the red eye home. I would do two stops, two meetings that day. You invariably, and this is a good message for all professionals, particularly young ones, invariably there was somebody in that audience who would not have been exposed to me otherwise, whose sister-in-law just became the director of marketing at this place, or whose brother wants to run for Congress. So you want to build your business, you can do this, everyone, but it's word of mouth and repeat business. Make sure you don't repeat the same mistake twice. And, you know, look, for me at my age and stage, I've learned as much from the agony of defeat as I have the thrill of victory. Oh, Kelly, and that is so such a wise word. I believe most of my successful 30-year law practice I retired is built on giving talks to developers for free. Uh, and then they're finding out that I knew the Endangered Species Act. Let me go back to Kellyanne and the, the here's the deal. I did live television for 10 years in L.A. with a great, smart, lefty woman, Pat Morrison. Uh, she got criticized on the comment line for her wardrobe every single day. No one ever noticed. I wore a blue blazer and a blue button-down right. shirt. It's a uniform. I've worn it for four years. And I'm never changing. But women and wardrobe. Now, you said you have a uh, scarf collection to uh, rival Dr. Burks. But is that all for all women at all time that they're always under the microscope when they're on TV for their 100%, clothes? 100 percent, and particularly by other women. So there was this content analysis. I, I think it made the final cut, and here's the deal on my new book. Hugh, thanks for reading it. I, there's this, there was this content analysis after the 2008 presidential race, and it basically talked about the coverage of Sarah Palin, John McCain's VP running mate, Republican, and Hillary Clinton, who had run, for herself, run herself for president in the Democratic primary, lost to Barack Obama. But the two of them were, the, were I mean, high-profile women running, on the national, running for national office. And people really focused on whether the color of their hair matched their shoes That's and their bag, incredible. what they were wearing, what they were saying, who was crying, who had cleavage. I saw the word cleavage. I said, my goodness. That was about how it So, yes, there is. I mean, I guess we can call it a triple standard. But, look, the visual is very important. What I would tell people is just be who you are. And I know people love I, – I joke a lot in my book about my, my bad hair life. There's that saying, Hugh, of course, you, I'm having a bad hair day. I've had an entire bad hair life. Yeah. But I own it. I have other assets. That's just not one of them. Uh, but, yeah. <laughs> you know, we just have to be who we are. And But I, I find the criticism often comes from other women, particularly on social media and particularly in the coverage because they're often female reporters. I went back and did a content. Selinda Lake and I did a content analysis, Democratic pollster. I love her work. She's a great person. Um, and she's just a, you know, we wrote a book together 15 years ago called What Women Really Want, hoping men would think it was a book about sex, run out and buy it and be disappointed to read what two pollsters had to say. Ah. But in, but net net, um, we did a content analysis at the time, and it was just indisputable that the coverage of John McCain and Barack Obama or Mitt Romney was, it was, oh, here's what they said today. Here's their brilliant policy prescription. And I got to say this about Hillary Clinton who, you know, I, I helped defeat in 2016, 2016, denied her the Oval. But guess what? Here, here's a very good point in her favor. She, she put herself in 2000 when she ran for U.S. Senate in New York, having never been a resident of New York, she put herself in what I call the campaign uniform, a black or brown or blue pantsuit, maybe once in a while, went a little crazy and put a sweater around her neck, had a sweater. But I think that doing that, got her back the column inches of substantive coverage. Ah, interesting. Now, now Kellyanne, we, the radio audience cuts away, and our, our podcast will hear this. I'm going to talk to you about Steve Bannon, Jared, 
and one issue uh, that uh, uh, I have some experience with. I want the radio audience to hear, though, on page 486. As far as the Conway Six are concerned, we always have each other in the most extraordinary gift imaginable. I, I want people to know you're good, uh, and, and you are good now. Uh, the most satisfactory paragraphs in the book are about Steve Bannon, with whom I've talked once, but who finds a way to say bad things about me pretty much oh. monthly. And, and I now know that I'm not unique, and indeed, I shouldn't even worry about it. Well, look, Steve's a really smart guy. We were in the trenches together in 2016 campaign. I've been on his show more recently about different issues. But, you know, one thing that was very disappointing is I feel there were not just him, but people had their own divisions within the White House. When I say divisions, like their own, um, they were they were dominion of their own group of people. And that's okay to have a staff. It's not okay, I think, to work across purposes with what the president is trying to do, and to accuse me of being a leaker while you're talking to the press all day long. Uh, and so, you know, I wow. have a great chapter in there called How to Spot a Leaker, yep. and it comes from a conversation I have with the president. Leakers get great press. Now, strike one for me. Uh, you know, leakers otherwise don't really talk to the media. They just talk to the media behind the scenes, but never, you know, never never out front. And, and gosh, I was out there every day. You saw transparently what I thought and how I engaged with the media. Well, that brings so, me to point, too. Uh, I was on the panel on Meet the Press the day you said alternative fact. Nothing has been more mischaracterized in America than what you were trying to say. What you were sure. trying to say is what Dan Rather said years ago, news is where you look. And where you look at these facts over here are, are an alternative set of facts than the ones you're looking at. They're all facts. Do, do you, you know, I, I never say anything bad about anyone I work with at Salem, at NBC, at CNN, ever. But do you resent that people purposefully mischaracterize what you meant. I mean, it was, I was there. I knew what you meant immediately. If you want to look here, you'll get this story if you want. And Dan Rather invented the phrase, news is where you look, which is alternative facts. Well, it is true. And I have an entire chapter, I think it's chapter 19 in the book, Q, uh, the new book here is the deal. Go pick it up, everyone. Kelly and Con, we hear. Alter it's called alternative hacks. And the reason I wrote that is because of what you just said that people won't let it die, but it's also all they have. I have no scandals, subpoena, indictments, investigations, zero. I left on my own terms and my own timeline. And they, they still talk about that, and they pretend that I was lying to the country when they darn well know I wasn't. Two and a half seconds alternative facts immediately cleared up and explained, should have been done in a moment, versus two and a half years, you a Russia collusion. Right. Two and oh. a half years. Yes. And we're and still, still going on the Sussman trial. That's right. But no, alternative facts. And I'm disappointed in Chuck Todd because he had made he and his, they made me a big offer on Meet the Press, which you know you've been a panelist on too. Uh, we went way back. He knew better, and he was laughing in my face. I was also I put in the book. I was also doing three network interviews on about four hours sleep. I was the first person in the Trump White House to go out and do Sunday shows. All three networks, ABC, CBS, NBC was the last one that morning. I'm looking into a blank camera in the freezing cold. I have no staff with me, no nets, no notes. And they, you know, they're looking at teleprompters. They have people in their ears. So that was what you call a true gaffe. I don't think Joe Biden commits gaffes. I think he's just not up to the job. That was an alternative facts was a gaffe. I corrected immediately. I was certainly not changing the relationship of the U.S. government with her citizenry in broad daylight. Yeah, I, I, it just it is. Every time I hear it, I just tell people but they I was the there. Gaffe. Uh, and here's the deal deals with it. Last thing I want to talk to you is about Jared. Uh, I dealt with him during first step. I dealt with him after the election. He invited me over to talk about presidential libraries, to, ended up taking me in to see the president. And when you talk to the president, you know, tell people what you tell them. But you and I have different views. I am just I'm just uh, surprised, actually, because it did not come out. And you never told me. I talked to you a lot. I talked to Robert O'Brien, uh, one of my closest friends in the world, Mike Pompeo. I know a lot of – I went over and saw Cipollone. I, I, I just never knew you two had tension. We did, and, and that's because I wasn't going to talk about it publicly. I didn't even bring it to the president that much, but it made others uncomfortable. I mean, if the president asks people to work together, as any other boss does in a workplace, you just figure out a way to do it, especially if your workplace happens to be the West Wing in the White House and your boss just happens to be president of the United States who's got this – unbelievably proud of the agenda because he wants to work with the same volume and velocity that businessman Donald Trump always worked, then, then there you go. And so um, Jared, though, I don't know, it was a combination. I think he looked down on me, for sure. I think it was a class issue. I was raised very differently than him. And he also loved to say I was a leaker. He loved to tell people that you can't invite her in there because it'll leak. So he'd exclude me from meetings, which would promptly leak. So I wasn't <laughs> in the meeting. The meeting leaked. And what happens is the president wouldn't remember, or he, why would he even care who was in what meeting, and he would call me. What do you think of this? 
what do you think we should do on that? And and it was amazing because he um you know, he would think I had been in the meeting, which I was excluded, so I would be end up being the only, the last person to speak with him before he made a decision. And by excluding me, all they did was make a bigger, bolder Kellyanne. But it was also I also the president had signed off on my portfolio. He yes. came up with counselor the president. He said, What do you want to do? And I said, I don't want to do press and comms. I said, I think women always get shoved in those jobs, and some people are great at them. I wouldn't have been a good press secretary. You offered me that. I would have been terrible. But he said, you'd be great. I said, Mr. President, I'd be a terrible press secretary. I don't even know what they do. And so still still trying to figure it out. And so uh, he gave me a policy job. He asked me what I wanted to work on. I was very upfront about it. And when the president of the United States, whose name was on the ballot, who got elected, said, go, you just go. You don't look for approval from others. But listen, Jared is a very intelligent person whose heart was in the right place, but he also has completely slinked away from any accountability for the 2020 election. I'd like him to come on your show and tell you if he thinks the election was stolen and where, if he thinks it was rigged and, and how, if, if he regrets anything about the 2020 campaign that the media said he was truly the, the de facto campaign manager. He was the guy in charge of the money. All the decisions went through him. I never hear him talk about it. In fact, he made a grand announcement last year that he's, quote, out of politics now permanently. Okay, well, that's very convenient. He's got a fund. He just got $2 billion from a Middle Eastern country. That's fine. This is, a, this is a free country. He's writing his own memoir. Great, Hugh. But why doesn't he come out and do what I do, which is speak, you know, address these head on and not slink away from things? I think when you've got all this authority and, and very little accountability, it, it's a bad combination. Yeah, you and I agree on the election aftermath, and that's why I think Jared does too. I don't, I don't know what will be in his book. I'll have mom when he writes his memoir, and I will read it. I want to thank you, Kellyanne, for Here's the Deal. It's a fascinating look, and it was there. I mean, you were there. More importantly, you've been doing this a long time. I just want young women, especially in who want, who are drawn to the life and the world, as, as Mark Leibovich, who you appeared with and you talk about in the book, wrote this town. This town is not easy, and you, you, you have bent it to your will, and I salute you, Kellyanne Conway. Thank thanks you for, for joining. Thank you, and thanks for your alliance and friendship of years, and God bless you. Keep killing. It was great to talk to Dwayne earlier. I know it says a lot about a boss to keep people around him a long time. Oh, no, I can't. I, he won't let me uh, do anything <laughs> without permission. Thank you so much, Kellyanne Conway. Bye-bye. Thank you.